Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. Taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible that you'd like to ask or about the Christian faith, the Christian life, any of that kind of thing. If you have a different viewpoint from the host and want to uh, uh, challenge something that you've heard on the program previously, you're always welcome to call in and we can discuss those things here in this coming hour. We have a few lines open right now, which is a good thing for those of you who want to call in because a lot of times that's not the case at the beginning of the show. The number to call is 844-484-5788. Once more, that number is 844-484-5737. And I think we'll just go directly to the phones and talk to, uh, it's going to be Eric from Compton, California. Eric, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Thank you. Um, Steve, I need your help with something. I had a uh, relative of mine send me a video of a pastor, and this is what he said. This is almost the first thing that he said. Uh, religion is man trying to find his purpose. That that was okay. Now, everything after that. The greatest source of human conflict has been religion. Every conflict, if you study it, uh, has been, every war that has been started has been fought because of religion. Then he says, Christianity is responsible for more killing than any other thing in the world. And the other comment is, that I wanted you to speak to is, some of us, this is him talking, some of us don't even know how bad Christianity really is. I, and then he talks about the, the Inquisition and the, uh, the Crusades. Am I correct in believing that this is, those wars were by the started by the Catholic Church, and as, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, please, Catholicism really isn't biblical Christianity, but the world has the tendency to lump all of uh, this, all of us in together. Um, can you speak to that for me? Sure. Yeah, well, first of all, the only way we could say that uh, you know, all wars have been started by religion would be if we included atheism and communism and Nazism as religions, and I guess they are in their own way. I mean, we're talking about world views here, uh, but but usually we don't think of communism and uh, you know fascism as religions. Those are more political philosophies. But insofar as uh, those those philosophies largely are based on atheism for the most part, and therefore atheism is certainly a religious view, and. Uh, more in the 20th century, more people were killed by communist and fascist regimes, but especially communists who are atheists, than in all religious wars combined in all centuries. Yeah, there's been some bloody wars, some nasty wars, some prolonged wars that were fought between uh, Catholics and Protestants, uh, between Catholics and Muslims. Um, you know, those kind of things have happened. And if the pastor who said that, when he says religion, if he's contrasting that from actually followers of Christ, there'd be a little more validity to his statement. The truth is that being followers of Christ is one thing. Being part of a religious system that calls itself Christian is a very different thing. Because as you say, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, they, they departed in many ways from the pure following of Jesus Christ uh, you know, in the early centuries of the church. And, uh, and they were involved in a lot of wars, um, and, and they persecuted people. They did the Inquisitions and so forth, though not anywhere near as many people were killed in the Crusades and the Inquisitions as people often think. I've, I've, I did some recent uh, reading on those very things, and I was surprised. There's only really, uh, you know, over a period of a thousand years or whatever, there's, there's a, you know, maybe as many as a few thousand people were killed as opposed to that many being killed, you know, in a, in a single concentration camp by Hitler or something like that, you know, in a few years' time. Uh, there have been way too many people killed in the name of religion and the name of Christianity, but, uh, you know, true Christians who follow Jesus don't initiate 
aggressive wars. They sometimes defend themselves against, uh, you know, aggressors, and that's, a, to my mind, a legitimate thing. But as far as just going out to conquer other countries and claim their land and things like that, that's not really a Christian thing to do, even though organizations and religions calling themselves Christians have done that kind of thing. Uh, but even so, if you add up all the religious wars, that would include the Muslim, Muslim and Catholic and Protestant wars, you don't find anywhere near the, the uh, body count that you do of simply Mao Zedong himself, you know, in China, uh, in his uh, cultural revolution, over, over 50 million people are said to have been killed by him. And Stalin and Hitler and people like that, dictators of the 20th century, Pol Pot, uh, have been known to have, uh, you know, th th their body count is also in the tens of millions. So, I mean, just in the 20th century alone, anti-Christian, anti-religious movements have killed far more people than all the religious wars combined. So this pastor is, uh, e either he is saying, listen, we need to follow Jesus and not confuse ourselves with religious movements, including ones that call themselves Christians, because these so-called Christians have fought a lot of wars, you know. If that's what he's saying, I can see I, I can see the need to make that distinction, and maybe that's what he was hoping to do. But, but if he says that all wars have been started by religion, uh, and Christianity <clears throat> is the worst of them, uh, he's, I, I guess he just needs to do a little more study of history. That simply is not statistically correct, not even close. So... Um, He's, he's probably woke, you know, I mean, not everyone who would say those, I mean, I'm, I'm not woke, and I would, I would certainly make a distinction between real Christians and Christian institutions, and I would certainly lay it at the door of some so-called Christian institutions that they have done horrible things and even started wars that they shouldn't have started. Again, it's nowhere near to the extent that non-Christians and anti-religious groups have, but it's still far more than it should be. But it sounds to me like if he's saying those things the way you said them, these sweeping generalizations, which simply aren't true, he's probably just repeating woke talking points that you hear from non-Christians. He's probably getting his information from YouTube somewhere, you know, YouTube people, influencers. They talk, you know, they, don't, they don't need to be correct because they're not, uh, they don't have to worry about being correct. They get their fans and their followers and... They could be saying the opposite of the truth, knowing that most of the followers would never check him, never fact check him. And so that's why you can't really just trust everything you hear on YouTube. And I'm, I, I think that pastor's just heard a few too, uh, a few too many YouTube uh, you know, videos uh, from the wrong side of the aisle. Thanks, Steve. That, that was my understanding. I appreciate that. I, um, I just want to hear it verified by somebody I trusted. Yeah, well, I appreciate your call. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye now. Uh, Jimmy from Staten Island, New York, a fairly regular caller. Hi, Jimmy. Good Hi, to hear Steve. from you. Good to hear it. Good to take the call. Um, I called last week, and I don't want to be obnoxious, so how often shall I call? Well, that would be equitable. You know, uh, there are. we've had people who've called more than once a week before. I. I think that usually, since we have a lot of callers, it's good to hear from maybe the same person, maybe not more than once a week, maybe twice a week on occasion, depends. But yeah, I mean, there are, we've had some people in the past who've tried to call every day, and we just, uh, you know, we have yeah. usually too many people waiting. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So it's okay right now? Sure. Okay. Um, Romans 3, 21 and 22, I would like to read those two verses. Okay. And um, do you know what genitive means? The generative case. I okay. Do. Let me read this. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So the, the, where it says here the righteousness of God, it's God's righteousness. It's genitive. The same with the faith of Jesus Christ. The faith is uh, Jesus Christ is genitive, faith is genitive. They belong to one another. So that's how we appropriate what is being said here, the righteousness, because it says upon unto all and upon all them that believe, or the ones that are believing. So the, the faith that we need to believe is the faith of Jesus Christ. And until God gets that faith, 
we can't believe because the Bible also says in First Thessalonians three two, deliver us from wicked and uh, wicked men, for all have not faith. So yeah, you've brought that up before. Let me just before well, yeah, know, before you go I'm, further, I'm going to ask you another. I'm going to ask you a follow up question, but let me just respond before just to that point first, and then we can go on from there. <clears throat> A genitive in the Greek can be an objective genitive or a subjective genitive. And therefore, a term like the testimony of Jesus can refer either to a testimony about Jesus or the testimony that Jesus is testifying. The testimony of Jesus can refer to his testimony or can refer to somebody else's testimony about him, depending on if it's an objective or subjective genitive. Uh, the same is true of many of these other phrases, the faith of Jesus can mean the faith that, that comes from Jesus, or it can be the faith that is related to Jesus or about Jesus. Uh, same thing as the righteousness of God. You read commentaries on, on that phrase in Romans. Uh, every commentator who's, who's not just rushing through it will tell you the expression, the righteousness of God, can mean God's own righteousness or the righteousness that we have from God. That is, one way it is seen as God's own character. The righteousness of God can mean his own righteousness, just like I talk about the faithfulness of my wife. I'm talking about her faithfulness. But the righteousness of God has that possible meaning. It also has the possible meaning, and sometimes, uh, in fact, uh, Reformed people usually believe this is what Paul means, the righteousness that is ours from God. It is of God, not of us. And uh, <clears throat> so that you can't just say, well, this is a genitive, and therefore it means this. Real, you know, real people, real commentators, real people who know Greek. I'm not sure how much you know Greek, but and I, and I'm certainly no Greek scholar, but I've read plenty of commentaries. Um, people who know Greek really well do not speak quite so boldly about that. They realize there's more um, ambiguity in that kind of a phrase with the genitive. But go ahead. You're saying that we can't believe unless God gives it to us. Do you think that well, verse tells us that? Well, it says here, upon all that belief, so God has given the reason that some believe is because of the faith of Jesus Christ. So when the Spirit of Christ, he's translated us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son, that's not some, you have caught an effect. It's not something that we cause by some action that we take. God takes the, makes the first move, like it says, we love him. Well, Jimmy, let me first. jump in here. Let me jump in okay. here, because it sounds like every time you call, you want to give a Bible study, and I don't mind Bible studies. But we don't have much time for one. I, the reason I let you call and talk at all is because you always want to call to defend Calvinism. And I do invite people to call and uh, disagree, disagree with me. The thing is, though, if you want to disagree with me in, in a format like this radio show, you're going to have to be a little more to the point. If you want to say, listen, uh, according to my views, that's your views, um, uh, we can't have faith unless God gives it to us. And here's some verses that say that that is so. But when you get off on things uh, that are on verses that don't talk specifically about that, I mean, you happen to you happen to read those through the through the lens, but they don't make that point. They, I mean, they just happen to be verses that anyone who takes the opposite view could say hello, amen to. Uh, that doesn't really use your time in a, in a way that helps to you know clarify the 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 case for your point. So uh, any any verses you want to give me that says that. And it has to say something like this. We cannot believe unless God gives us the faith. I'm, give me all the verses you have on that, if you would. Because to just say that God gives faith or God grants to believe and so forth, that doesn't tell us that we can't believe uh, without him giving it to us. Uh, we, it would say that, you know, our faith, our ability to believe God comes from something that God did first. But what did he do first? Well, in Romans chapter 10, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how God has allowed me to have faith is he's allowed me to hear the word of God. He's allowed there to be a word of God. He's spoken. He has spoken. He's provided his word. He's sovereignly allowed me to have the privilege of being somewhere where I can hear his word. And faith comes from that. Therefore, I can say, if I believe, <clears throat> that's all the mercy of God. That's that's God's beneficial gift to me that I was allowed to hear the word of God. Many people have never heard the word of God. Or even before I heard it, that God spoke at all. God didn't have to speak, but God did. That's a very, a very great generosity of him to the human race, that he took time to communicate with us. He's been specifically generous with you and me, and that we've been able to hear the word of God, and we're able to respond to it. And faith comes by that. Now, 
But when you say that God grants us faith, I, I agree. God grants us faith. I, I couldn't believe if God hadn't granted the opportunity to hear the gospel. Well, in, in right. Matthew, it says, blessed are your ears. You just brought up Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So where does the hearing come from if we're all under a curse, according to Isaiah 6 and Matthew 13, 15? But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So again, God has to do something for us that we can't do for ourselves. We can't hear. We can't. No, see, th this is what Calvinists do wrong. I, I did cut you off. I, I just want to fit in because you're going to go off on some more preaching here on this point, and, and you're making a wrong point. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 and Isaiah chapter 6 are both places where God says about Israel that hearing they will hear and not understand, uh, and seeing they shall see and not perceive. Uh, they've made their hearts uh, heavy and their ear, their eyes they've closed lest they should see and, and, uh, and believe and be converted and so forth. Now, you say, see, that says we're all under a curse. Well, first of all, it doesn't say anything about a curse, but let's, let's allow it. Let's allow that he is saying that some people are under a curse. He didn't say it about you or me. He said about Israel. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet to Israel. God called him Isaiah, and gave him a vision in Isaiah chapter 6 and commissioned him to go speak to Israel because this was their condition. God describes that as their condition. And then when Jesus came, like 700 years later, he says, you know, you Jews, you're in the same condition the people were in Isaiah's day. He said, well, did Isaiah speak of you when he said, this people draw near to me with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And was, Jesus saw that the Jewish people of his day were in the same condition as the Jewish people in Isaiah's day. But Jesus didn't say that was true of all people at all times. And that's how you're... See, that's, that, this is what Calvinists do. They say, listen, uh, you know, we're all, uh, you know, we're like a leopard that can't change its spots, like an Ethiopian can't change its skin, because that's what, uh, you know, Jeremiah said. Um, or Isaiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things, and who can know it? Uh, you know, or all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. These are very common Calvinistic statements from Isaiah and Jeremiah, which are actually describing the people that Isaiah and Jeremiah are talking to. And the reason God sent prophets to them is because they had become that bad. Or they'll quote from Genesis 6, where it says before the flood that the hearts and imaginations of people's hearts was only evil continually. And they'll, they'll take that as if that's a, an anthropological, philosophical statement about mankind. When it's really, an, it's, it's a prophetic denunciation of a certain people who had reached that point uh, and, and are about ready to be destroyed by the flood because they've reached that point. We can't just take every negative statement that the Bible makes about certain people and say, there you go, God makes this judgment of all humanity. Well, if he does, he didn't say so. And, uh, and for us to extrapolate from that, that, it, that he thinks that is simply human imagination. You can't find a statement in Scripture that says those things about all people. You can find statements that, that are specifically about a group of people who, we can tell by the number of prophets that God sent against them, they were utterly wicked people. They're worshiping Moloch. They're sacrificing their babies to Moloch. Uh, you know, they're murdering people. They're sleeping with their, wives, their neighbor's wives and things like that. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of corruption. Well, yeah, there's... Certainly the Jews of Isaiah's day or Jesus' time were not the only people who've ever had that true of them. There's lots of people who have that true, but it's not, it doesn't say it's true of everybody. I know a lot of unbelievers who aren't uh, sacrificing their babies to Moloch, frankly. Uh, I, have, I have unbelieving neighbors who don't do that. I have unbelieving neighbors who haven't murdered anyone, for all I know. Uh, in other words, the things the prophets said about the people they're denouncing were true of those people, and maybe many other people too, but you can't take that and just say, okay, there's a general statement about humanity there, and that's exactly what Calvinism does. It's the only possible way that Calvinism can uh, support a doctrine of total depravity, because the Bible doesn't support it unless you take verses that don't say it and apply them in a situation that the Bible doesn't apply them to. That's a, that's a way of doing a scriptural studies that I don't think is responsible, and I'm not going to go along with it myself. Can I ask you one more question? I'll get off. Sure. Okay. Um, I really never got a clear answer. Thank you for the long uh, explanation. But um, in Second Thessalonians uh -huh. 3, 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and weak men for all have not faith. It, right. Is this uh, saying only certain men or all? Uh, 
it doesn't say men and folk all have not faith. And I'll take my answer over right. there. Right. Oh, if, if you are saying all men don't have faith, meaning no men have faith, then you're totally misunderstanding Paul. Paul is saying, I don't, I don't expect a problem from those who have faith, but I hope you'll pray that I'll be delivered from unreasonable women because not everybody does have faith. That's what he's saying. Not everybody has the faith you guys have. If, if Paul said no men have faith, then that would have to include his readers and all the Christians and Paul himself because he's a man and he had faith. No, what Paul's saying is not everybody has faith, and therefore there's some wicked people that I need to be protective from because they're not, they don't, they're not like-minded with us. Now, if if you're understanding that to mean all men are faithless, well, then that certainly isn't what Paul meant. What he meant is that not all men have faith, and by that he specifically means not all men have the Christian faith. He's not saying that people who aren't Christians have no faith at all. Uh, many people have a great deal of faith in themselves or faith in their money, or faith in their government, or faith in some false religion. Uh, all men have faith. All people trust. If we didn't have any faith at all, we would not be able to walk out of our houses. In fact, we wouldn't be able to be in our houses because we'd be afraid that the builders weren't competent and the house was going to fall in us because we don't have any confidence. We don't have any faith in those people. We wouldn't drive our cars because we wouldn't have any faith that the other drivers weren't going to come over into our lane and, and smack us head on. We wouldn't be able to take any medications because we couldn't trust the doctors or the pharmacists. We wouldn't be able to trust any newspaper stories. We wouldn't be able to trust anyone because we wouldn't have any faith. No, everybody has faith. Everybody lives by faith. It's just that not everyone has faith in God and in Christ. That's the point that Paul's making. So if you're making a different point from that, I'm, I think you're seeing the verse uh, differently than Paul intended for it to be understood. Okay, let's talk to Randall from Tacoma, Washington. Randall, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for taking my call, Steve. Um, uh -huh. I have a question about Esau. I lo uh, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. It's in Romans 9.13 Romans. and Malachi, yeah. Ro Romans 9.13 and Malachi uh, 1, uh, mm -hmm. verse uh, 3. Two or three. And, and I'm, I'm just curious. Um, um, I don't want to, you know, say anything wrong about God, but can you explain why that is so? Before uh, they sure. even did anything sure. good or bad? <laughs> no, he didn't say that about them before they did anything good or bad. Paul says in verse well, 11 of Romans 9, in, right. in Romans 9, 11, he says, For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her. Now he quotes Genesis here. The older shall uh -huh. serve the younger. That's a quotation of Genesis 25, 23. Then he quotes another verse, right. this one from Malachi. Jacob I have right. loved and Esau I have hated. Now, before okay. either of them were born, before either of them were born, God told Rebecca, their mother, because they were twins in the womb, that one of mm -hmm. them would serve the other one. And that's exactly how their fate turned out. Uh, Jacob became prominent. Esau, his twin brother, uh, did not. And uh, mm -hmm. but but it was not it was not really the men themselves, but the nations that came from them. These are actually prophecies about the nations of Jacob and Esau, because when it says in Genesis 25 that when uh, Rebecca felt these twins fighting among themselves in her womb, uh, she asked mm -hmm. God. He said, "Well, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be divided from between your feet." And he said. The older shall serve the younger. I mean, the older nation, the, the nation of Esau, would serve the nation of Jacob, is what he said. Now, the man oh. Esau never served Jacob, but the, but the nation of the Edomites from Esau did. Now, hello? Nobody's perfect, so they well, sure. can't well, let them keep doing what they do. Right, when you talk about church come up with that you know well nobody is perfect when you go kick everyone out of the church because they're sinners no right. everyone's a sinner but every christian is a repentant sinner and if they sin again they repent what we're talking about here is somebody who's sinning and is not repenting even randall okay I, I guess maybe not well let me finish this out um I don't know why that happened. Anyway, uh, the, the, na the nation of Israel would be prominent over the nation of Edom. That's what God told Rebekah when he said, the older shall serve the younger. That is Esau, the older twin. 
his nation would serve Jacob's offspring. Then also in Malachi, when it says, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, that also is talking about the nations, not the men. Because God is telling Malachi that after the Babylonian exile, which is when Malachi was writing, God had restored the Jews from the exile. He had taken Jacob's nation and restored them and showed you know, favor to them. But he had not done the same thing with the Edomites, who also went into captivity in the time of the Babylonians. So both nations went into captivity, but God restored the nation of Israel. He didn't restore the nation of Esau. And therefore, what's being pointed out here is that God chose one of the two sons of Rebekah and Isaac for special privilege, not for salvation. He's not even talking about anyone being saved. The Bible never tells us that Esau was lost and Jacob was saved. What the Bible tells us is that God chose one branch of the Abrahamic family to carry on the Abrahamic blessing, which is to bring the Messiah into the world. He, he favored Jacob for that and not Esau. That's the point that's being made there. Hey, I, I need to take a break. I wish I didn't, but uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we have another half hour coming up, so don't go away. The Narrow Path is listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, you can write to The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593, or go to our website, thenarrowpath.com. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Don't go away. Small is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. Welcome to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you, but everything to give you. When today's radio show is over, we invite you to study, learn, and enjoy by visiting thenarrowpath.com, where you'll find free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse -verse teachings, and archives of all The Narrow Path radio shows. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Remember, thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for another half hour taking your calls. Uh, if you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith or a different view from the host and would like to raise those things for conversation, we have a phone line and uh, actually a couple lines are open if you want to get to us. The number to call is 844-484-5735. That's 844-484. 484-5737. Our next uh, caller is Craig, who's calling from Lincoln, California. Hi, Craig. Welcome. Hello. Hello, Craig. Yes, it's Craig. Go ahead. I am calling. I just joined this uh, Pentecostal uh, church. I'm, I'm regularly a free Methodist, but I moved away. So I want to ask about tongues. Now, the whole church is speaking in tongues, and I, I feel pressured if I don't get to speak tongues that I'm not, I need to let go of something or whatever. Is this true? Okay. Well, you might not be uh, cut out for a Pentecostal church. There might be a different kind of church that would be better for you if if you're not a tongue speaker because the pentecostals do believe that everyone's supposed to speak in tongues and that can put a lot of pressure on somebody in the church who doesn't do it um the pentecostals have a doctrine that when you get baptized in the holy spirit you speak in tongues it's called the initial evidence doctrine that speaking in tongues is the initial evidence of being baptized in the holy spirit they also teach that not all christians are baptized in the Spirit. Unless you go into a United Pentecostal church, they believe that anyone who doesn't speak in tongues isn't really saved. But but Pentecostals who are a little more mainstream, like the Assemblies of God or the Foursquare uh, and some of the bigger denominations uh, that are, you know, a little more biblically oriented, they, um, they believe that speaking in tongues is the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they also believe that uh, there are Christians who have not done it, and there are Christians, be but they have not been baptized in the Spirit. They believe that getting saved is one thing, and being baptized in the Spirit is another thing. So they would suggest that if you don't speak in tongues, you might be a good Christian, but you're not filled with the Spirit yet. 
and you'll know you are when you speak in tongues. Now, I'm not sure which kind of a Pentecostal group you're in, but I would have to say that, uh, frankly, even though I have spoken in tongues, I would not feel comfortable in a group where everyone was speaking in tongues at the same time, because that's simply not the way the Bible says it's supposed to be practiced. Uh, that's not how tongues is, according to the Bible. In, in the Bible, uh, Paul said two or three people, maybe, in a church service should speak in tongues, one at a time, and each one should wait for the previous one's uh, utterance to be interpreted, which is another gift of the Spirit. Speaking in tongues is a gift of the Spirit, along with many others that Paul lists. Uh, interpretation of tongues is another one. And Paul said that those two should always be working together if you're speaking in tongues in a church service. So if somebody's going to speak in tongues in church, Paul said one at a time, no more than two or three total, and, uh, and each one has to be interpreted. Now, most Pentecostal churches do not regulate speaking in tongues like that. And, and part of that is because uh, the revival that, that kind of launched the Pentecostal movement in the early 1900s, um, it really was a revival that was more based on an experience than on uh, biblical norms. And, uh, and speaking in tongues became a really commonplace thing among those in that revival. So much so that it became the distinctive of their group, the, the denominations that formed from that, the Four Square, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, and other Pentecostal denominations were formed from that revival. They were distinguished by speaking in tongues. It's the one thing that they did that other churches didn't do. And so it becomes kind of a, it's sort of like some churches are distinguished by their, their uh, Reformed theology or distinguished by, you know, their verse-by-verse -verse Bible teaching, like the Calvary Chapel movement is or something like that. The Pentecostal movements, their distinctive was they speak in tongues, and other groups generally did not. And so it became kind of the thing where you're under pressure to speak in tongues if you're in that group. That's kind of a rite of passage if you grow up in a Pentecostal church. Until you speak in tongues, you're really kind of expected to you know, cross another threshold in your faith and speak in tongues. I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I don't believe the Bible teaches that everyone's supposed to speak in tongues. And that's why I said it may be that you coming out of a, a, a free Methodist background which has theology that I, I would be probably more agreeable with in some respects than with the Pentecostal theology, um, then th th it might be hard for you to really fit into a Pentecostal church, especially if, as you say, everyone's speaking in tongues at the same time. That's, that's either something that you're probably going to sit there criticizing in your heart, or you're going to sit there thinking, boy, I better get on board here and, uh, and maybe be pressured into doing when it may, may or may not be what God's Spirit is doing in your life. In other, in other words, it's very rare, very rare to sit in a Pentecostal church, not be a tongue speaker, and not either sit in judgment or in criticism or feel like a second-rate Christian. Now, if you're a tongue-speaking Christian, then you probably feel quite comfortable in a Pentecostal church. I'm a tongue-speaking Christian, but I, I don't feel comfortable in Pentecostal churches because they, they make that such a major thing and they don't necessarily regulate it biblically in many cases so uh you know while i don't criticize people for speaking in tongues i certainly uh am not comfortable in a church where biblical norms are not being followed and you know whether you can or not is up to, is going to just be up to you but but i i just want to say that if they're giving you the impression that you've got to speak in tongues to be a, a first-rate uh, follower of jesus uh, that's the tradition of their denomination. It certainly is not something the Bible teaches. All right. Let's talk to Sean from Portland, Maine. Hi, Sean. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I'm doing all right. Hey, I was listening to uh, um, 109 AM out of Baltimore, a guy by the name of Chuck um, Krismeyer. Are you familiar with him? I don't think so. Okay, he's uh, written a couple of books. Uh, Antichrist was one, and he's got one coming out when the persecution comes. It was very informative. I just wanted to pass the word on what I heard today. Um, it was basically about the uh, Bill Gates, what, what he's doing in uh, India. He's doing the uh, digital ID, digital public uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And if you know India, they have 20% of the world population. So if they're making it mandatory that to buy or go to do, to do anything, you have to have this mark of the digital ID to do anything. And this, he's got 50 other countries going to take part in this. Yeah, well, you know, Bill Gates is kind of a scary guy. And he's because he's so rich, he can get a lot of things done that other people who might be equally scary would do if they could. Um, I'm not surprised about that. Um, actually, it's, on this show, I don't really spend much time cataloging the evil things that evil people are doing in the world, not because they're not important or alarming. That is kind of alarming. But because they're not directly related to the Bible. Now, I'm sure that the, the preacher on the radio that you're referring to in bringing this up was probably saying it is related to the Bible. He probably was saying it is uh, the mark of the beast. Uh, because in Revelation 13, 18, we read that the a, a number, 666, is going to be uh, imposed on the right hand or the forehead of everybody uh, who complies with the system of the beast. And, of course, you take that mark and you're, uh, and you're going to hell. If you don't take the mark, uh, you're going to probably get your head cut off or something like that. You won't be able to buy and sell, and you may be actually uh, martyred. This is the standard dispensational understanding of the mark of the beast. My, my understanding of the mark of the beast is somewhat different, and therefore, while I have no doubts, A, that Bill Gates is doing something like this, and B, that this is a kind of a scary thing, I do not necessarily believe, C, that this is the mark of the beast mentioned in Scripture. Uh, people have done scary, nasty, uh, oppressive, tyrannical things for, for thousands of years. This is a high-tech, tyrannical thing, which makes it a little more scary, but but I don't, that's not how I understand the mark of the beast in scripture. And therefore, it's not, to my mind, a biblical thing. It's more of, you know, we can make a long laundry list of terrible things that powerful people in politics and in finance and banking and, and uh, entertainment, all these different areas and, and uh, universities, uh, some really nasty stuff is, is being introduced, stuff that should be very alarming, but not but doesn't have a direct tie that I know of to anything in the Bible. But, uh, I mean, thanks for sharing that. I've heard those kinds of things myself, too, and I do not think that's in any sense a good development. It's a, I think it's a terrible development. All right, let's talk to uh, Jose from Santa Maria, California. Hi, Jose. Welcome. Hey, Steve. God bless you, man. Thank you. Hey, Steve, a quick question, um, or a couple of questions here regarding uh, the book of Revelation. Um, I, I was born again in a uh, Pentecostal church, and so trying to deconstruct uh, my dispensationalism, I've been going through uh, some of your videos and stuff and uh, um, really uh, edifying my, my, my faith. Um, but, but the questions are um, regarding the 144,000. Uh-huh. And also regarding the two witnesses in um, the book of Revelation, um, coming from a, uh, you know, a dispensational point of view, they look forward and say that, um, as you know, the 144,000 are going to be um, Jewish believers uh, during the Great Tribulation, and uh, that the two witnesses are going to be either Elijah and Moses or Elijah and Enoch. Um, but looking at it uh, in a preterist view, or partial preterist view, if that's passed, um, then who would those 144,000 uh, be? And also, who would uh, the two witnesses be in the past? Um, yep. And then also, the- um, sorry, sorry, Steve. Also, if, if uh, and what are the chances of, of the book of Revelation having uh, double fulfillment, something that happened in the past and maybe something that can happen in the future? Okay, yeah. Uh, as far as your last question, I don't think uh, the chances are very great that it has a double fulfillment. Uh, it's not impossible. I mean, frankly, any any prophecy, I, I suppose, could have a double fulfillment, but we're not given any evidence in Scripture that that's the way to look at it. You know, usually when a prophecy is made and then the thing happens that was prophesied, it's done. You know, I mean... The prophet said that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He was. You know, he's not going to do that again. Uh, the prophet says he's going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, he did, and that's not going to happen again. Um, 
most, you know, the Bible talked about the fall of the Edomites, the fall of the Assyrians, the fall of the Moabites and Ammonites. Those, they fell, and they haven't been around since. They're, they're not going to fall again. Most prophecies, when they're fulfilled, are, are simply fulfilled. And, uh, and there's, generally speaking, no reason to expect a secondary fulfillment. Now, the exception would be is where a, a prophecy is given, and this would always be, as far as I know, in the Old Testament, that has a short-range fulfillment, but that short-range fulfillment is a type and a shadow of something that would be fulfilled later in Christ. Uh, the birth of Isaiah's baby in Isaiah chapter 8 seems to have been prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, but also we in the New Testament were told that Jesus, that, that Isaiah 7, 14 had to do with his birth as well. Uh, and there's things like that. There's there's passages about God re returning the uh, the Jewish exiles from Babylon, and and he did. But some of those have a typological fulfillment, which, which the identi is identified in the New Testament as referring to God saving His people from the bondage of sin, which He does. You know, which is our salvation. So you know, there are such a thing as prophecies that have a fulfillment in the Old Testament, but that they have a, a but they serve as a type and a shadow of Christ, and therefore they have a, a later fulfillment in a spiritual sense in Christ. I don't know of any prophecy that has a secondary fulfillment in the same sense that the first one was. That is, uh, something that happens in the Old Testament that's a type of something is usually a physical thing that happens, but it's a type of something spiritual. Uh, you know, physical circumcision is a type of spiritual circumcision, for example. The, the, uh, the physical tabernacle is a type of the church as a spiritual ta temple and tabernacle and so forth. So uh, th to simply have a prophecy, and this time it's in the New Testament, in Revelation, and it has a fulfillment that takes place within a few years after its time, after the prophecy, and say, yeah, but there's going to be another fulfillment of kind of the same kind. Uh, that'd be, I don't know of any precedent for that kind of thing. I don't know of any other New Testament prophecy that has uh, that is a type of something later than its original fulfillment. Um, so uh, you ask what are the chances. I, I would say the chances are not great at all. I mean, God can do whatever he wants. He could fulfill Revelation 13 or 14 or 20 times in history if he wants to, but I don't think he did. The idealist view of Revelation kind of thinks that's what he did. The idealist view is that Revelation's visions kind of play out again and again and again throughout history. They don't usually apply any of it to 70 AD, but they do apply it to many wars and cycles of history throughout history. That's the idealist view of Revelation, which I, I, I only take in one, one part of Revelation, really, pretty much, and that's uh, the part that has the two witnesses. I consider the two witnesses to represent the church. I won't go into all my reasons now. I do have lectures on that. You, you said you're listening to my lectures, so you'll hear my reasons if you listen to my lectures on Revelation 11. Uh, as far as the 144,000 go, that's not so difficult because if the plagues of Revelation occurred in connection with the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is what the Preterist view holds, then the, the Jewish people who were sealed to be protected from those would be the ones who were saved from them, who, who did not suffer in the fall of Jerusalem. Now, we have the 144,000 described as 12,000 for each of the 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation 7, but in Revelation 14, the only other time they're mentioned, it says that they are, uh, they, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Okay, we know they're Jewish because they're from the 12 tribes of Israel. We know they're Christians because they said to follow the Lamb. That's Christ. Um, and it also says in Revelation 14 that they are first fruits unto God. Now, first fruits is an imagery that speaks of a harvest, an ingathering of crops. Now, the church age, I believe, the past 2,000 years, has been the ingathering of the, of the, of the sheep, or the wheat, I should say, sheep too, but of wheat in the, in the harvest. And for 2,000 years, God's been harvesting souls into the church. But the first fruits, the very first ones, were the Jews in Jerusalem. That's where the first Christians were. In fact, for many years, the only Christians seem to have been in Jerusalem. But they, they escaped the Holocaust of 8070 because they fled uh, and didn't suffer in it. So I believe they are the first fruits of the church, and they are therefore the, the ones that are said to be delivered from that Holocaust 
So I take the 144,000 to, to represent the Jewish Christians, the Church of Jerusalem, uh, that escaped from the judgment that came on Jerusalem by, by leaving when actually the Holy Spirit sent a message to the Church in Jerusalem telling them to flee, and they did, and therefore uh, they escaped. So that's who I would identify them as. But if you want really detailed treatment of any of those things, I have verse-by-verse -verse lectures on Revelation, and you can listen to it on my website. I, I leave very few stones unturned. I certainly give a lot more information about those two points in those lectures. Thank you for your call. Let's talk to um, it's uh, John from Minnesota. John, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. First time caller. Great to have Listen you. Listen to, pardon me? Great to have you. Let's go ahead. We got a lot oh. of people waiting and only a few minutes left. All right. Um, Jesus, when he actually started, where people started recognizing him, people started following him, and he came out of his youth or whatever. There's about three years of documentation, am I correct? Of his ministry, about three or three and a half, yeah. Yeah, right around three. So in that three, three and a half years, how many miracles are actually written um, in the in the Bible? And, and, and do you have uh, something on your website that actually just goes through all the different uh, miracles that he performed? Well, I don't have a separate lecture catalog in all his okay. miracles. I have, a, of course, I have verse by verse teaching through the entire four gospels. Yeah. So we do yeah. we do yeah. talk about all his miracles. Um, yeah. Jesus Jesus did far more miracles than are recorded. In fact, at the end of the book of John, John only records seven of them, and he says many other signs Jesus did, which are not written in this book. He said. He said there were too many. He says, if everything that Jesus said and did was written down, he says, I suppose the world itself couldn't contain the books. In other words, wow. Jesus did a whole lot more than is, than is written wow. down. Now, we know his ministry, public ministry, is about three and a half years, but there's only about 39 days of ministry that are actually recorded. That is, in those three and a half years, you know, he ministered over a thousand days, but only 39 of those days do we have any uh, you know, detail about what he said or did on those days, which means, mm -hmm. you know, what he did was probably two, you know, 200 times more you know, than what we have record of or something, you know. Um, so I, I believe I've seen lists of Jesus miracles. I, it's never concerned me to count them up, but I believe that I think it's between you know, like in the late in the high 30s or something like that of recording. Yeah, I didn't really those care about the number or anything. I was just wondering about the, yeah. um, like his, like Mary, right? Did, did she ever record anything when he was young or? Well, no, she probably was not literate. She probably, she didn't write anything. Oh, uh, but she okay. certainly, Luke, Luke certainly talked to her and, and the other apostles, yeah. when she was in the church. After Jesus yeah. went, after Jesus ascended to heaven, she's mentioned as being in the church on the day of Pentecost, and so she was part of the Jerusalem church. And all the apostles would have, you know, it's like if she was in your congregation where you go to church. You know, you could talk to her anytime you want. You could get a lot of information about the youth of Jesus if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. So realistically, it's just a matter of reading through which chapters of the Bible would you recommend so that I could, um, I recommend them all. I recommend them all. Just read through the book. Of I know. Are you trying to make a list sometime. of them or what? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. Not, not, not a very long, you can read it through in a, in a couple hours sitting. Yeah. On the, on his miracles. All right. You can read through Thank the gospel you. of Matthew in, in an hour and a half. Okay. Yeah. God bless you, John. Uh, thanks for your call. I gotta gotta take some more calls here. Uh, let's see here, Gary from New Jersey. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Hi, Steve. I'll make it quick. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. The, the question I have today, that the Lord put on my heart, is uh, starting with the Jewish people and with the scriptures like Isaiah, Zechariah. You know, we can go over scripture after scripture that describe Jesus perfectly. The Son. 
and everything else. Uh, S-O-N will be born. The virgin will conceive a child, and it will be called Emmanuel God. And your question. How come... Uh, how right. come they, they don't see this like we do? We can say, oh, there he is. And he's, some of these other people say, oh, no, he, he doesn't okay. fit the scriptures. I said, that's crazy. I'll take your answer off the air. Okay. Okay, thanks. Why don't the Jews recognize Jesus when we have all these prophecies about him? Um, well, there's a couple of reasons that only Christians would believe. One of them is what Paul said in Second Corinthians 3. Paul said that, to this day, the Jews, when they read the Old Testament, there's a veil over their minds, so they can't understand them. It says, when they turn to the Lord, then the veil is taken away. Um, and, and there's other passages that speak similarly, that, you know, the, the Jewish people who rejected Christ are somewhat blinded, not just to him, but to the very meaning of their own Bibles. And, uh, and that would seem to be the answer that Christians would accept. Now, the Jews would, if you ask them, why don't you believe in that? They would say, well, I don't see this clearly as referring to Jesus. And, and they'd be right about lots of these passages. I mean, because you have to turn to the Lord in order to see them, uh, they are the kinds of things that you can see after you're a Christian more readily than you can see before. Now, there are some things that an open-minded person could see without being a Christian, for example, Isaiah 53 is quite a description of Jesus, so much so that I've heard of more than one time when a Christian would read that passage to a Jewish person, not telling them that it's in Isaiah. They just say, let me read this passage from the Bible to you. And they read Isaiah 53, and the Jewish person would say, well, that's obviously talking about Jesus, but we don't, we don't accept the New Testament. Well, it's not in the New Testament, it's in the Old, but they didn't know that. But in other words, there are there are a few passages that are so clear that an, um, an unbiased listener would know that's referring to Jesus. But very few people are unbiased. Uh, Jewish people have their own religion. They have their own vested interest in being right. If Christianity is right, then the Jewish religion is wrong. Um, you know, and it's like if someone wants to read something uh, to, from the Quran to prove something to me, well, I, I don't accept the Quran. You know, I, I, that's, I have other views than that based on better evidence. But the truth is that Jews have their traditions. They have their family connections. They have their alternative beliefs and their religion, just like all religions. Judaism isn't really like uh, Christianity 101, and we who are Christians are Christianity 102 or, or whatever, 201, whatever. But, uh, but it's like Judaism is more like Islam. It's an anti-Christian religion. The official view of Judaism is that Jesus was a false messiah, that he was an imposter, that he was the son, as the Talmud says, uh, of a Roman soldier who raped a Jewish girl. And, uh, and that when he was crucified, it was because he was a sorcerer. This is what the Talmud teaches. That's, what, that's the holy book. That's the doctrines of Orthodox Judaism right there. So... Judaism is not a Christian or even a quasi-Christian religion. It's an anti-Christian religion, just like Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Sometimes people mistakenly think, you know, if, if a person is Jewish, they're like almost Christian. Well, well, not really, because they, I mean, they might believe in, in one God, which sets them apart from Hindus and Buddhists and pagans, but then the Muslims also believe in one God. I mean, it's, it's like they're as far from Christianity as a Muslim is. So that's why they don't accept it. Uh, if an open-minded person reads those scriptures, there are some scriptures I think could persuade them that Jesus is the Messiah. But a lot of, a lot of the uh, prophecies that Christians recognize that were fulfilled in Christ, they're just not so clear in the Old Testament that it would compel a Jewish person to believe him. You've got to have an open heart toward Jesus before they make sense to you in that way. I'm out, I'm out of time. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. My name is Steve Gregg. We are listeners supported. Our website is The Narrow Path. Dot com. Check that out. And we'll be on again tomorrow, Lord willing. Tune in then and we'll continue our discussion. God bless.